Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome from New Brunswick Theological Seminary to all of you gathered for this, our third colloquy on understanding theological education in the Reformed Church in America. Today is talking about women in theological education, and we are pleased to have Lynn Jappinga. Lynn is a professor of religion at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. She was the 2019 2020 Hazel B. Gennady Fellow in RCA Women's Studies at NBTS, which means that she got to um, be on the inaugural flight of the all Zoom <laughs> presentations from the Reformed Church Center um, back in March when we were all putting this together by the seat of our pants because suddenly we didn't have places to meet anymore and it wasn't safe for us to be meeting. Um, she is a minister of word and sacrament in the Reformed Church with degrees from Hope, Princeton Theological Seminary, and Union Theological Seminary in New York. In addition to her teaching at Hope, she has been a prolific author of books, articles, and resources for the church, and a busy preacher, teacher, and workshop leader. Um, one of her very important books that's not the most recent, but is fair, still fairly recent, is Loyalty and Loss. The Reformed Church in America, 1945 to 1994, and much more recently, Preaching the Women of the Old Testament, Who They Were and Why They Matter. Our other presenter today is Liz Testa. She is a pastor, minister of word and sacrament in the RCA, currently leading RCA Women's Transformation and Leadership, a ministry that encourages, equips, and empowers women to embrace their gifts, honor their stories, and live into their God-given callings. Prior to joining the RCA staff in 2014, she spent 12 years on staff at Marble Collegiate Church in New York City. Um, she was raised biculturally in New York and in Spain and holds degrees from Syracuse University and Drew Theological School. She's passionate about building bridges between diverse cultures and contexts um, and is certified in unconscious bias training through the Cultural Intelligence Center. She lives in um, South Orange, New Jersey with her husband and their two daughters. But um, today she is actually in New Brunswick. So it's always good to have somebody actually at the seminary when we do these things. Um, Liz and Lynn will each present briefly. Lynn will present first and then Liz. And then after that, we'll have a discussion. So. Without any further ado, Lynn, go right ahead. All right, thank you so much. Um, thanks to all of you for your interest and presence in the conversation. I appreciate the invitation from James to think about this topic and do some really initial preliminary research on it. Uh, a quick word about my own experience with theological education. I attended Princeton Seminary in the early 1980s. I did two years of supervised ministry with Len Kalkworf in the early 80s, um, also, obviously, and he and the congregation were extremely welcoming and encouraging. I went to grad school and served a couple of interim pastorates. I taught feminist theology at New Brunswick in 1986. I served on New Brunswick's Board of Trustees, and I taught part-time at Western Seminary from 1988 to 1992. And since then, I've been observing Western from across the street, as we say, while teaching at Hope College. So compared to many women in the RCA, I have had a relatively easy time uh, getting through the process and finding a job, a main job. But I've also been listening to women's stories for 40 years and it's clear that sexism and discrimination have shaped women's experience in varying degrees in the seminaries and the RCA. So what I'm doing here is a very preliminary overview and I hope it will help women students process their experience and provide a window to other interested people to see what that experience was like. So a brief comment about methodology. There were not many sources to go to on this topic. So I sent out about 180 surveys of women clergy and received about 30 in response. It's a small sample, but it was an enlightening one. I also read some oral histories that I had on hand from 15 years ago. And I reviewed the papers from the Board of Theological Education. I had a couple other things. So these sources show a lot of diversity of experience. Women in the same cohort in the seminary might have had a very different experience depending on their home church, their classes, their field education. Uh, it was almost always easier for women in the East than the Midwest. 
Um, and so I make some generalizations about what follows, but I realize that there are exceptions to almost every statement. So if you feel I'm not representing your experience accurately, please tell me your story. I'll begin by noting, just so I don't get accused of too much negativity, uh, some of the many positive factors of theological education in the RCA. There are over 200 women clergy now, and they are a wise and gifted and talented group. Uh, the seminaries have helped to train and form these women as pastors, chaplains, and other kinds of ministers. These women have had some excellent professors. Almost every woman mentioned teachers who encouraged or challenged her and who fostered a love of theology or Hebrew or history. Even before ordination was legal, the professors supported women. Richard Utterslice, a Western professor, wrote a paper in the late 1950s already that insisted that the Bible did not uh, keep women out of ministry. It's too bad we haven't paid more attention to that. A number of women also mentioned important mentors, whether those be home church pastors or college chaplains or professors in college and, and also their pastors of teaching churches. So these people were often men, but many more women as time went on. And they asked them questions like, have you thought about ministry? Even it was when it was not an option for women. They noticed gifts and affirmed them. They said, you are really good at this. Over and over, it was a mentor who steered women towards seminary and ministry. And there were also congregations that graciously received ministry from women students and helped them learn to be pastors. And for that, I'm especially grateful to the Reformed Church of Willow Grove for, for being that for me. So at their best, the seminaries functioned as a supportive community. Um, women often look back fondly on their time in seminary, but overall, there have been a lot of challenges in the last 50 years. So some quick examples. Um, in 1975, Hugh Coops was installed as a General Synod professor at New Brunswick Seminary. Uh, the liturgy included a prayer which praised God for the, quote, great men of history, and an anthem entitled, quote, happy are thy men. And in the same archival folder was a pamphlet advertising the seminary's layman's school of theology. So maybe we've made a little progress. In the late 1980s, Diane Motors Pitzer started teaching liturgy at Western and she tried to make the worship services use inclusive language for God and humanity, which caused a fair amount of consternation. And I wonder how many RCA meetings have you attended where you were asked to sing, Be Thou My Vision, including the lyrics that referred to you as God's true son, all right? So maybe we haven't made that much progress. These vignettes illustrate that women have really not made steady progress toward greater inclusion in the last 50 years. Uh, the number of clergy women has grown, they are employed, many of them, but the journey has not been smooth or easy. And I want to acknowledge that this was not an easy process for the seminaries either, particularly for Western, where the culture was far more resistant to women and other people from diverse backgrounds. So in what follows, I wanna explore a number of categories, uh, four of them, about women's experience. And I'm gonna use as headings for each category, some of the most powerful stereotypes or assumptions that are often made about women. Now keep in mind that what follows is based on stories from the last 50 years. And I know that much has improved over time, but I want us to consider what women have experienced in the past. So the first phrase I want to explore is, quote, women just can't be ministers. So early on, uh, women heard this a lot. Sometimes it was an outside voice. Sometimes it was their own voice. That's a powerful word of authority that invokes a higher power that no one can challenge. It isn't just church polity. It's God who has determined since the beginning of time that women cannot be ministers. Well, that has really messed with women's sense of call. Imagine a woman who studies religion in college, demonstrates leadership skills, is encouraged to go to seminary, feels this pull or this call, and what does she hear? Women just can't do that. One woman was told by her father, quote, you should have been a man. And her response, so whose mistake was that? Her father also asked her repeatedly, who do you think you are? Those are powerful, devastating words and many women heard them in some form. 
So it's no wonder that some women come to seminary doubting their call. They hear the internal call, but the external call says no. Not no, you don't have the gifts for ministry, but no, you are mistaken. You can't be called because you are female. Keep in mind that the church did not stop saying this even after women's ordination was approved in 1979 and even after years of seeing women who clearly were gifted ministers. So the seminary has done a little better eventually at recognizing women's calls, but classes and congregations, especially in the Midwest, have resisted. Some classes care committees heard women speak hesitantly about their call and assumed that meant they were not cut out for ministry. Other women were affirmed for wanting to study Christian education or counseling, but not when they wanted to be pastors. Seminary professors were usually far more encouraging. So one woman told Tom Bogart that she wasn't sure about her call and he said, look, you get up several days a week to drive 30 miles to study Hebrew at 8 a.m. I think you are called. Okay. So the second problematic phrase is, quote, the church is not ready. All right. This was trotted out repeatedly between 1918 and the 1950s, whenever a class is overtured synod to allow women to serve as elders and deacons. Before her ordination in 1978, Lanny Hill received letters begging her not to be ordained because it would split the church. So it was better to sacrifice one woman's call for this conscience of the church. The church was not ready. Now, over time, several seminary professors and leaders have observed that women students were actually a lot smarter than the male students were. Uh, again, that's probably debatable, but it's pretty true in my experience. Uh, following an awards ceremony at Western Seminary in the 90s, a group of women were congratulating each other in the hallway because they had won almost all the awards. A male student walked by and said, well, you may take all the awards, but we will get all the jobs. So how is it that women could win awards, get excellent grades and be fine pastors, but still not get jobs? The church was not ready. This reminds me a bit of the Canadian woman who observed that whatever women do, they must do twice as well as men in order to be thought half as good. Fortunately, she said, this is not difficult. All right. In New York and New Jersey in the late 1970s, some pastors and classes were no longer willing to wait for the church to be ready. They chose to ordain women before it was legal. And so uh, Claire Miller Jameson talks about going to New Brunswick in the mid 70s and getting you know, total support from her classes in the seminary. It was a lot more difficult at Western where the president of the seminary said in the, the same period, that the seminary would not advocate or encourage any action which would violate the government of the RCA. So women students at Western, especially in the first 20 years, often found it difficult to find teaching churches and opportunities to preach. Western actually had to waive the requirements for outside preaching because it was so difficult for women students to fulfill them. One woman student showed up at a church to preach only to find that they were expecting her husband she was sent away because apparently no preacher is better than a woman preacher, at least was at the time. Another woman in the early years heard a staff person on the phone say to a church looking for a preacher, quote, there's nobody left. Would you take a woman? So Western admittedly was in a difficult position. It was happy to take women students and their tuition money. There was no financial aid for part-time students most of the time but most churches were not happy to take women students. And Western needed financial support for those, from those churches and they did not want to offend them by making a big deal about equal treatment for women. So women welcomed, or Western welcomed women students but did not do a great job dealing with the systemic sexism and exclusion that the women students encountered. Several women wished that there had been much more coaching about how to handle the call process, which was often sexist and demeaning. There were questions about whether they would have children, how they would raise them while working, and whether they could still submit to their husbands while serving as pastors. 
What saddens me most about this refrain is that it is one thing to say the church is not ready in 1918 and another thing to still be saying it a century later. In some ways, the RCA is less open to women now than it has been. People are still trotting out the biblical texts out of context. They are still arguing for complementarianism. And so here we might explore the influences of fundamentalism, congregationalism, anti-intellectualism, and general cussedness in the RCA. Now that's another paper, but it's clear that much of the resistance to women in the denomination is related to the larger problem of denominational identity. I wonder what it will take for the church to be ready to accept the gifts of all of its people, regardless of gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation. It's interesting to me how often oppressed groups take the blame and get the resentment for the denominational dysfunction. So women certainly uh, were the target of a lot of resentment and anger over people who didn't like what the denomination had done. Similarly with the debate about gay and lesbian people in full inclusion, um, there's a kind of resentment of, of those folks who, for causing the problem when it's the church that's causing the problem. Now, let me just point out that it isn't just the RCA. Uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in North Carolina put out a video a couple of years ago of all the weird things men have said to women clergy. So Google that sometime, it's eye-opening, all right? So a third phrase often used is, uh, those women are so angry. Hmm, given what I've just said, I wonder why that is. Several women said that they came to seminary with some naivete and innocence. They were nice girls who did not want to make waves or draw attention to themselves. They did not know much about feminism and would not have used that phrase to describe themselves. Administrators liked these nice women and sometimes said approvingly that these women students weren't strident or militant, they just cared about ministry. So there's a lot to unpack there. In the 1970s, when the first women were in seminary, feminist theology was just beginning to develop. And the initial group had to focus all their energy just on getting ordained. But I think that later women started seeing gaps in their education. Where were the women in church history? Where were the women theologians? Where was feminist theology? And why were women so often either ignored or denigrated in the Christian tradition? And once they started asking these questions and seeing these issues, as Mary Daly said, they can't go back to not seeing. And so they started to speak up. And when the women spoke up about the treatment they received, when they asked the seminary to speak up for them, when they asked to be included in the curriculum, when they encountered resistance to inclusive language, they sounded angry and they were angry. And the church isn't very comfortable with that. And it has often chastised women for being angry without asking or caring why they were angry. Lanny Hill said something that struck me. She was talking about the negativity that she often heard from women at clergy retreat, retreats. But really she said, it's grief. So it's helpful, I think, to look at that from a different angle. Why is it that women are angry and frustrated and grieving? Because they've so often had to defend themselves and their call. Because they're all so often told they're not legitimate. Because they're so often asked that question, who do you think you are? And all those seem like perfectly legitimate reasons to be angry. <laughs> anger is a response to injustice. It's a sign of caring, but anger is dismissed and punished and that's still true now. Finally, the last phrase I want to explore a bit is, we love women students. And that's true, but at Western, there has also often been a qualifier following that phrase. We love women students as long as they aren't too radical, whatever that means. We love women students as long as they don't cause trouble or complain about, say, sexual harassment. We love women as long as they aren't too wounded. I think this is a topic that could use a lot more exploration. 
that students who come with a lot of pain and grief are often dismissed as somehow weak and too tender-hearted and not tough enough to be pastors, but it's the church that's often done the wounding. We love women students, but we don't wanna make a systemic critique of sexism. We don't wanna call the denomination to repentance. That's interesting that New Brunswick, I think has done significantly better on this in part perhaps because they've made a significant effort at anti-racism training. Heightened awareness of one injustice likely leads toward more awareness of other injustices. They saw the systemic nature of injustice. Western and the RCA as a whole were much more reluctant to do this kind of systemic analysis. A few women have been chosen to be the token women. And there is sometimes an assumption that the really talented women will rise to the top and that's evidence that the system is open and you know, gracious, but it's far more complicated than that. And I must admit, I benefited from some of that when I was a younger woman, but now that I'm not a very nice woman anymore, I get into more difficulty, but that's another point. Um, Western was nice to women, but it did not really fight for them, especially in the early years. Did not feel able to take risks. I was amazed that I went through 20 or so years of Board of Ed Theological Education minutes and the issue of, of women students was mentioned only once or twice in the minutes. Um, whether the board had too much else going on or just didn't think it was important or whether the seminary didn't, uh, you know, Western especially didn't wanna air its dirty laundry, I'm not clear, but it's striking to me that the governing board just never really wrestled at least in minutes with the implications of these questions. So in conclusion, uh, this project has reminded me of how resilient and courageous these women clergy are. They have experienced a great deal of resistance and resentment, and yet they persisted. And the stories are so powerful of commitment and devotion and love for the church and a willingness to put up with amazing amounts of garbage, um, and yet this persistent love for the church and God's people. And I am honored to be able to read some of their stories and share them with you. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Dr. Japinga. That was so wonderful to hear. Um, your considerable research and um, it was wonderful and yet it was uh, challenging. And um, I am always grateful to sit with you and hear your wisdom oh. and from the people that you gathered it from. So good afternoon, everyone. I am the Reverend Liz Testa. I am the Denominational Executive for Women's Transformation and Leadership in the Reformed Church in America. And I have been serving in this capacity for six years. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Brom for the invitation to be here today to share a little bit about what I have been seeing uh, and experiencing uh, with RCA Women in Theological Education uh, during these six years. Uh, and even before then, just to say, um, uh, James already introduced me so well, but I, uh, I am theologically trained. I have my Master of Divinity from the Drew Theological School that's nearby here in New Jersey, Madison, New Jersey. I went through the MFCA process uh, with the classes uh, and the classes of New York to become credentialed to become a minister of word and sacrament. So that whole pathway of how we are credentialed in the RCA for uh, ordained ministry was one that um, having not come from an RCA context, uh, really did challenge me. It took me seven years to finally become ordainable and, and, and receive uh, that blessing to become ordained. Um, uh, also to say that I am here in my office at New Brunswick Seminary. Uh, the RCA has a small office suite here. And so I'm the one, we're only allowed to have a few of us here at a time. So I'm the one that's here right now. And um, I also, sit on the board as the ex officio alternate for our general secretary, Reverend Eddie Aleman. So I've been really privileged to sit on the inside of what a seminary is doing to try to create equity for all its students. And so that will be a little bit of what I'll be talking to you today. I was so delighted to hear Lynn mention the anti-racism efforts uh, of New Brunswick because when I first came in to sit on the board, uh, Dr. Greg Mast, God rest his soul, was announcing to the board that they had just done this final audit 
where they had created a 50-50 split on the board of people of color and uh, Caucasian or white people, and also a 50-50 split of uh, women and men. And so I was delighted to come in in that season when they had just been working for their first 10 years on this anti-racism and working on other isms as well. And then uh, we're now living into the rest of that. And uh, Dr. Micah McCreary, the president of the seminary is part of that fruit of that, of that, uh, that labor, as well as having so many women on the faculty, staff and administration. So, um, just to say a little bit, I, I wanted to do a little bit of research for you. So I did ask the seminaries, I'm going to speak mostly about MBTS and WTS, Western and New Brunswick um, today, because that is RCA, that is where the bulk of our folks are trained for ministry or do receive their theological educations. Um, I, of course, I've already told you that I wasn't one of those folks that did, but so there's lots of the rest of us too that are uh, trained in other places. And Dr. Jaffinka also mentioned Princeton. So we also value those, but just to kind of get us um, an understanding of where we're at with our agencies, with, with our um, higher education institutions. Um, so just to say, it was kind of interesting for me. I asked for some stats um, and New Brunswick, uh, has actually had an increase in women, their percentage of women. They went from in 2015-16, they had approximately 40% of their master's candidates uh, were women. And then that has progressed forward. So today, approximately 66% of their master's candidates are women. And also to say um, another little piece of statistics, that I also want to be talking about today is the certificate programs, which are kind of an on-ramp for non-traditional students to get into the pipeline, to get equipped at higher levels than uh, they would have otherwise. So the uh, New Brunswick certificate program currently has 11 folks in it that are RCA and 10 of those are women. Uh, so so that's a little bit of a, of, of, of a perspective on New Brunswick. There's this increase in women in theological education, studying theological education. Also to say, uh, thank you, Amanda. She provided me with the statistics for their faculty and staff. And they do have um, pretty much a, uh, their administrators, administration is 50% women and men. Their regular employees is just about 50%, uh, even a little bit more. And their faculty, five women out of the 12 are, uh, are women. Five out of the 12 are women. So it gives you a little bit of perspective on that. And then uh, with Western, actually, I was seeing a little bit of a shift in the opposite direction. So the statistics I was able to get from them were around their candidates for the certificate of ministry, which is what is required in order to be um, put forth for ordination. That's an ordination credentialing. In 2018, they reported 10 out of 26 of their candidates were women, that's 38%. 2019, it was 35%. And then now in 2020, uh, it was 27%. So there's actually a shift downward, quite significant, 11% in just three years, downward shift of women candidates for the credentialing, the certificate for ministry. Then um, their numbers regarding uh, overall percentage, they have pretty much a, uh, it was kind of a, like a, a 40, like 45, 55% split in 2019, and now it's moved to be a 40% to 60%. Uh, with, with men being the 60%. So a little bit uh, interesting to see that difference. And so I, I'm a little curious of why that's so, but I, I put that out to all of you to think about why would at Western in West Michigan um, have a, kind of an, an upswing with male percentage, whereas here at New Brunswick, we have an upswing with women. Uh, so that's just something for us to, to, to consider together. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about, uh, we talked about the anti-racism focus at New Brunswick. Also just to name into this space uh, with great um, respect uh, for the situation, but a few years ago, Western did have some um, uh, 
there was a whole situation that arose around Title IX. And it was discovered that they actually didn't have Title IX in place, which is um, protection for women against harassment in, uh, in, in the workplace and in the school. And they approached that, I have to say, as directly, I believe, as they could. They were very careful and very um, uh, focused on addressing it. Now, there were some challenges with relationships and with the students and faculty and staff as they were inside trying to navigate that together, like relationally speaking, but that really was part of their process. Um, in terms of the bigger picture, I did have many wonderful conversations with Rayetta Perez during that time, and she was the Title IX, the person that was assigned to oversee the Title IX. Uh, and I could really tell that they were taking that seriously. And so I feel that there has been a shift. Um, as one of the uh, professors said to me, you know, she'd been waiting for the seminary to have this conversation for 17 years. And Dr. Japiga did allude somewhat to some of those challenges that Western has um, faced uh, and has been um, uh, subjected women to, quite honestly, over these decades. And I just want to say I am hopeful that now that that um, measure has been put into place to have that Title IX uh, kind of framework to be able to help undergird the work that they're doing to try to be more egalitarian and more um, embracing of women's gifts and callings within the seminary. I feel hopeful that 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 things are that there's a course correction now, and so we are going to see um, things shift in that regard. And I believe that they already are. So one of the things that uh, is just delightful for me in my role is that I get to meet so many women living into their gifts and callings and many times um, helping them to prompt them to see what is it that God is, is calling them to do and help them to do that, to get their courage and to uh, live into that. And there's a, a few women that I just wanted to lift up to you kind of anecdotally, but just to show you where women in theological education, it really is happening and there is great fruit to this labor. So in terms of uh, the certificate program, uh, we in Women's Transformation and Leadership did notice that we had a gap between our women that were doing our learning processes, our small group uh, leadership collaborative, which was really for women um, that were just starting to explore what is it that God has for me? Uh, how can I live better into my leadership gifts? Then once they completed that, uh, then some of them naturally go to seminary. I know there's a few that are here today that are actually with us that are part of this whole process, this pathway. So some then are ready to go into a master's program. But we found that we had a gap between those two. And we needed something that was a deeper equipping, especially for our women who are elders and deacons, but really for staff women on, in churches, uh, really all, all kinds of women. Uh, and diverse women. I am talking about women not uh, that are um, second career, women who are seasoned in the faith, who have been in church for many, many years, also women of ethnic racial diversity. That was something that was very important um, for us was that we were reaching all women in the RCA, some that had been in historically marginalized uh, communities. So uh, New Brunswick worked with us with this new online certificate program that they've just been rolling out uh, in theological studies and in church leadership. And we were able to draw in 10 women to take this two-year course. And I'm so grateful to New Brunswick for offering that, for, for us being able to have that partnership. But really what it shows is there is this pathway for women getting like in the church context, having some training and equipping, and then really wanting more, a higher level Level of education. So the certificate program is a great on-ramp for that. And we know that there are some women that from the certificate program have then moved into uh, seminary master's programs and then even into doctorate programs. So there's something happening also at Western in this regard. And it is with the Latino folks. Uh, Western has started the Spanish language certificate program and they also now have a um, master's program and doctorate in Spanish. And so I have a whole group of these beautiful Latina sisters from the, um, many of them are in the Southwest, they're church planters, and they really needed equipping and they were not ready for an actual master's degree program. So they have, uh, there's a whole crop of them that went through the program at Western and they have come forth now 
bringing in more. So they're church planters. They're all about bringing in, multiplying. So they've now got another, a next, a second generation of leaders that are moving into the certificate program. And then several of the women and, and men too that went through that Spanish certificate program have now started the Spanish master's program. And we even had one woman, Gretchen Torres, who graduated with her master's last year and now she's starting in the doctorate program. So both seminaries are, are I think, really addressing the need for folks that want more education and that this could be a bridge. Uh, the program at, at at New Brunswick is also one that can be um, helping those who are getting credentialed for their commissioned pastor um, uh, certificate and also for preaching elders. So this I, I see is just a wonderful opportunity for us to get more lay people in the pipeline on the pathway to living fully into their gifts and callings um, with higher education. Uh, also to say with uh, the sort of the prophetic voice, right, the prophetic voice of women and particularly the prophetic voice of, um, of women of color. And so there's three women that I just want to quickly highlight for you that have come through the doctorate programs um, at both uh, New Brunswick and at Western. And so here at New Brunswick, uh, in these last years, last decade or so, uh, two women spring to mind specifically. One is the Reverend Dr. Patricia Singletary, who uh, graduated with her DMEN from New Brunswick. And uh, the focus of her study was on an African burial site that she had found under her church uh, or nearby to her church which is the Elmendorf Reformed Church in East Harlem. It's the oldest church in Harlem, as she likes to say. And uh, they discovered in church papers that there was this um, African burial ground uh, that was nearby and had since kind of gotten forgotten about. And uh, a bus station had been paved over it and there it lay. Well, she, through her, um, through her project for her DMEN, started to really research this. And fast forward after many, many, many just um, kind of intentional phases of, of working on this, today that African burial site has been named officially as a African burial site by the city of New York, and they are proceeding to sort of unearth it, move the bus station away, and they're going to create a beautiful park and um, exhibit there. And that's all because of the work that one of our prophetic pastors, Dr. Singletary, did um, through her doctorate at New Brunswick. So we give God thanks for that. And that's part of our RCA history. So it's such a beautiful, um, it's such a beautiful way that uh, that one of our leaders was able to claim our history and share it with, with all of New York City and now the world. Then there's Dr. Seeley, Dr. Patricia Seeley. She is the pastor at Mott Haven uh, Reformed Church in the South Bronx. And part of her work, uh, her demon was on incarcerated um, women and the impacts on their families. And so since then, she created a nonprofit that she now leads out of, uh, out of her church. And she also served um, on our uh, commission uh, for uh, Christian action and brought forth many recommendations that were approved by our General Synod, encouraging and urging us to deal with the, the issues of mass incarceration. So we give God thanks again for Dr. Seeley and the way that she was able to live totally into, um, use her demon to be a prophetic voice in the world and then to found a nonprofit out of it. And then finally, there's Reverend Dr. Denise Keenum Greer. She is from Western Theological Seminary and her doctorate on this model of uh, from outreach, the concept of outreach to embracing is now taken form as the First Corinthians 13 project and as her being our mission liaison to the children, um, the orphan children of South Africa. And uh, as the one of the first women or uh, receiving a master's degree and her doctorate from Western. She was the first one in both of those cases. Uh, it is amazing and just a wondrous thing to see how she is sharing uh, that work that she did through the doctorate program prophetically out and in influencing so many people in the world. So I see that my time is coming to an end. So I will close just saying that um, there is great hope for 
Uh, I believe women in theological education. I am so grateful to both New Brunswick and to Western for the ways that they are courageously addressing issues pertaining to women. And also at the same time to honor that we still have a long way to go. Just as Dr. Japinga said, there is, there is work yet to be done and there are absolutely stereotypes and um, biases that must be um, worked on and, uh, and that we must confront them. And the best way forward is together. So this is a communal effort for us to be able to see how we can um, overcome some of the, the ties that have bound us and that continue to bind us. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I look forward to the questions. And thank you, thank you, Liz, and thank you, Lynn. Um, and yeah, this is the time for us to all enter into discussion and questions. Jerry Ishida. You can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Um, yes, uh, my, my question is, so you said at the end that there, we have a long way to go and we have challenges. So maybe if Liz and Lynn would share with us, maybe what would be your, your top one or two priorities for uh, change for women in theological education? Well, I guess I, I would just quickly say, Jerry, that I think we're already starting to address some of those challenges. I think just naming them as part of it and putting systems in place that will help to uh, guard women from some of those, um, those uh, stereotypes and biases. So I think training and um, and this is for our faculty, staff, and administration, as well as the students themselves. I think that has to happen. I think also we just need to keep having more women in positions of leadership that can just show that shared leadership model of men and women leading together uh, to help to um, override some of those uh, previous constraints that that Lynn was was mentioning. Um, I, I so I, I also want to say that one of the ways that I think we're overcoming the challenges is simply by creating pathways for women previously on the margins to move into theological education. And so the certificate program, for example, is one way that I think that's being addressed. And I love that it's happening here on the East Coast where we have um, this group of 10 that are coming through the church leadership and theological studies certificate program. There are pri primarily women of color, both Asian women and African women of some uh, from the African diaspora some way. And then also the Latinas that are coming up through the, the process um, at Western. So looking at new ways to bring women and particularly women of color and from diverse backgrounds through a pipeline that uh, a pathway that previously had really been structured for young white men. And so that's one way that I think we're gonna overcome these challenges. Good, I'd, I'd echo what Liz is saying. Um, I would also add though that um, I think there needs to be more like just feminist theology, education in the seminaries and other places, um, women in the Bible, women in theology, women in church history, so that both men and women have the resources and the the experience with the ways that women have been a part of the Christian tradition for a long time. Um, so I think that is helpful that that feminist theology and related topics are not just women's, you know, electives for women. There are things that everybody ought to be studying and learning. And secondly, I think that the, the yeah, sorry, the denomination has a lot of work to do on this issue. Um, you know, as I said, I think that things have changed in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. And there's a powerful conservative fundamentalist, you know, trend that's taken over the RCA. And that is just not generally very friendly to women, um, or it may be friendly to some women, uh, but it's not always friendly to ordained clergy women. Um, who have kind of feminist perspectives. It's often very authoritarian. And um, I just think the RCA needs to do some work about who it is and what we really value. And are we fundamentalist in, in our reading of the Bible and in our treatment of people or are we not? And how are we gonna sort that out? And um, I, I think that's just gonna be significant for the experience of women in the future and men actually and LGBT people and lots of others. Dr. Jap and guys, so appreciate you saying that. And what that makes me wonder about is, you know, what is the connection between sort of that, that 
that sector of the RCA and our theological institutions, right? Our higher education theological institutions. And so how do we create better bridges there? Um, and we do, and, and also to say, as you are one of our premier feminist scholars, uh, we also have several women who are coming up who are just becoming, re receiving their PhDs and are coming up that that is one of their central foci. So I am excited uh, in that regard that we do have some fresh voices that are coming up to come alongside sort of the wise women like yourself to, to be, that are also teaching that can help to, um, to bridge that gap. And, and also just to say like Travis West, Dr. Travis West at Western, he, he's teaching absolutely making sure that the, that the biblical stories of, of women are part of his courses and, um, and bringing those to life in new ways. And, and also in the same breath in our world over here, I mean, we're not within a theological education setting in the work that we're doing with women's transformation and leadership, but we have this whole uh, Bible study series that she is called women of the Bible study series, which is all for it's, it's created to be for men and women. So I'm, I'm, I, I take on advisement what you're saying, and I, it gives me even more energy to want to make sure that we continue to produce these things and have these resources and make sure that we are availing, you know, making sure that folks are availed of them. Um, to use them wisely. So thank you for well, thank you. that vision. Appreciate the work. <laughs> Patricia Johnson. Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, hi. Um, yes, I am currently a, a student at um, New Brunswick Theological Seminary. And I've also, been privy to be part of um, a women's um, Bible study group um, that was held in um, a, a trip um, in Israel last last year about this time, I believe with Dustin Keepers. Um, and I think that, you know, in conjunction with what is being said about curriculum, um, you know, and, and also with the current um, women's Bible study that is also mentioned, um, she also had a lot of information that we participated in and, um, you know, group work and, and studies um, about women in the Bible as well. So, you know, I'm just maybe as a recommendation to New Brunswick and also probably um, Western, you know, again, to include some of these materials that you know, are being originated and, and can maybe be part of the curriculum because, um, you know, it's like, um, I guess, African American studies, you know, if you see yourself, um, if, if one sees themselves um, as an example that, um, you know, there are other women, um, other black women, you know, if we're saying with African American history, but, you know, in Bible studies with other women who, who um, are in the Bible, women of the Bible, um, and women see that, you know, the impact of women in the Bible as well, it would be, you know, very good reference point too. That's it. Ladies. Well, I just want to recommend that Dr. Jappinga has, well, she's got a feminist theology book, but she also has a beautiful book called uh, Preaching Women of the Old Testament. And so I commend that to you, Pat. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, Pat. I said in the chat, you know, you're exactly right. Then that's true of, of people of color and, and just all, uh, just important to get very different stories out there than people have traditionally had in the old days of the white guys. Uh, we're the main characters in everything. So thank you. Okay, um, Arlene Wilhelm. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I don't really have a question so much as I want to say thank you to Lynn for lifting up the women in the past, the women uh, who were ordained illegally, quote, illegally, because they were the women who inspired me to keep on keeping on. Uh, this year, I celebrated my 35th year of ordination. Uh -huh. And so it, it's been an incredible journey for me. Uh, but they, they were my inspiration. And also how, 
how we older women are, are reaching out to some of our younger women. I went on a Sankofa, a couple of Sankofas with Liz, and it was just a wonderful opportunity to connect with the younger women who are who are going forward. And I, I commend you for that. And to keep on doing these these ways of connecting the people who have gone through the, the so-called battles, the so-called, you know, uh, make, making the way for uh, the women of today uh, to encourage them and to give them hope. And, and I know we have a long ways to go, but we have also come some ways as well. God bless you both for your work and your ministry. Thanks, Arlene. Thanks. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, thank you for that word and thanks for your hard work and for being one of the first to, you know, to fight the battles at the beginning. Those were challenging times. So thank you for hanging in there and thank you for your 35 years of service. Appreciate it a lot. And, uh, and yes, congratulations. We celebrate, always celebrate all those beautiful milestones. And also, um, Arlene, I just, I, I want to, I, I thank you for naming that, the importance of honoring our stories and the legacy of women in the RCA. And that was a huge piece that I was really needed to do. And I, I mean, this forum right now, it's like between Lynn and James, you know, and you and, and so many others, I had to really help the RCA in my ministry right, in kind of in my, my little star that I live in, um, of women's transformation leadership, but to reclaim the history of women. And, and I always thank Russ Cacero because he was such a faithful help, helpmate to that. Um, but, but that we, do not, we are not striking out on our own from scratch. And so to always honor our ancestors, to honor those, the legacy. Um, and so, you know, all the many ways that we've done that through the Sankofa and our legacy of leadership booklet and all these different ways. Um, it's so important that we remember that because sometimes we have this amnesia, right? There's like this sort of institutional amnesia wanting to just sort of press forward, which is a very Western ideal. And, and, and part of the joy of this work that, that I've uh, been able to do is, 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 is part of that, is, is honoring those of you that have come before us and that have, um, have, have overcome so much. Uh, and so, and then it also helps us see where the patterns are. And so, you know, when we're looking to dismantle systems of oppression of any kind, we do have to see the cyclical nature. So there's kind of a, it's, it's a, a double, um, it's a double endeavor there, right? There's the one of honoring and celebrating, and then also knowing that we go not alone, but in the company of, of one another and to glean the wisdom of our foremothers, but then also to understand how think patterns continue. And so that's what we really, you know, we need to focus on that. And I think pertaining to Jerry's question about, you know, how do you deal with the challenges? That's one of the ways we're trying, we're endeavoring to deal with the challenges. Well, I want you to know, oh, I want you to know that uh, I am still working. I'm going to be 82. And now I'm with, I was with the Methodists for about 10 years. And now I'm with the Lutherans. So ecumenically, I've been uh, involved. So uh, God is not with us. God still has lots and lots to do with us women. God bless you both. Amen. Okay. John Chen, go ahead and unmute. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm John Chen. I graduated from MPTS in, 19, in 2014, 2014, about uh, six years ago. And I just want to uh, thank you for the women movement because you guys have uh, came to a long way and you guys are in the forefront and facing all the challenge and and uh, you know in the, you know and, and doing well uh, I, I recognize the women in my life I have four generation of women that has influenced me to make me what I am so I always recognize the contribution of women that coming from your perspective. Uh, I'm saying that because I, my grandma, my mother, my wife, and my daughter, so they all have influenced me in one way or the other to make me what I am. So I really greatly appreciate, uh, you know, you guys doing all these because we need to recognize that we cannot be hiding, you know, behind a closet or in the back. Uh, you know, we say it always, they always have a old saying that they in any any great men, there's a women behind them. And that is so true. And uh, I'm glad that you guys are recognizing and I ask you guys continue to do this 
and to help our men to be more successful. And we help each other to become successful together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elder. Mary Canfield. Unmute. What one presentation you both made. Very informative, very good. And you both did your homework, which I really appreciate. Um, I would like to draw attention to our past and to the women who are a part of the colonial Dutch movement and settled in Manhattan and so on. And they, uh, they, when they arrived, they followed the Dutch legal system. And these women had legal rights. You could, they had two different marriage contracts. You could keep your own name. You could inherit your own money. It was not the English. Uh, judicial system that we came to later. And when the colonial Dutch arrived, they were not fighting with the church. They brought the church along with them. And not only did they bring along the church, but they brought along diversity. They were out looking, outward looking. They, they came here to make money to be entrepreneurs. And the women were very much a part of it. They, when their husbands left their farms, the women had a legal right to speak on behalf of their husband in a court of law. So um, it was a very different situation from the 1840s when the Dutch came over, the Dutch, I mean, 40s and 50s and then in the 80s again. But in the case of the Dutch coming over in the 40s, number one, they were running away from the church. They did not, they wanted to be separate. They wanted to be left alone. They retained their Dutch ethnic heritage. They did not want to intermingle, which is why you have all these little Dutch communities that popped up all along Lake Michigan, including, um, you know, Van, Van Ralty and his, the, the group that settled with him. Um, so you've got diversity on one experience, migration, and you have separatism on another. And then those two decided to become one. The, the church in the Midwest joined the church in the East and became the reformed church in America. And because of the women's world mission movement and the world and the domestic mission movement as well, that started in 1875, you had women from the Midwest working hand in hand with women from the East. And so it wasn't a matter of regionalism. It, they had a single organization. They worked for a single purpose, and that was mission. And they worked, they followed the same structural setup that, that we have in the denomination. They have uh, local congregations who join in classical unions, who join in regional bodies, and then there's uh, the, the national group overseeing. This worked well. This held us together. It was Lynn like part of the glue that held us together. Right. And that worked until about after World War II. And then it began breaking down. And um, with uh, when the women's board, which was so strong, and the women could raise money. Oh, they were better at raising money, of course, than the denominational board. But they were very powerful. And this did, uh, the denomination, of course, it was after the war, things were changing. But the uh, women's board was subsumed into the denominational board. The women were not given equal representation. 
And the bottom line was efficiency. And that's, if you look through the issues, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency is almost always the reason for actions being taken. So um, we have now a lot of cultural changes, but this old tension between the East and diversity, because that's who the East is, and the Midwest, um, we have lost some of that cohesiveness that was achieved through the Women's Mission Boards. And we have worked very hard to find new and different ways. I mean, when uh, um, the, uh, Beth Marcus and you have the, the first RCM and the creation of the Commission on Women, but the bottom line is women need women. We need each other. Sometimes we need each other as buddies, and sometimes we need each other as colleagues. And how are we going to achieve both of those things? And they come out of very different traditions, of course, but we have to find new and different ways of educating, as you've pointed out, but new and different ways of being together because we need each other. We share things with each other. And the whole point of the Women's Board of Foreign Mission was to serve other women and children. And um, that's where uh, we, we sort of stand today. Anyway, those are just comments and from an old historian who sits here doing yeah, <laughs> writing history. But anyway, thank you both very much for your presentations today. They're wonderful. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, I'm putting making a note about something we need to do for a book project here. So yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mary, thank you for naming all of that. Um, on our last Women's Sankofa, we stopped off at the Marble Parlor where that first uh, women board, Women's Board of Foreign Missions first meeting happened in 1875 in their hoop skirts. So I appreciate that you brought that up. And, and also, Mary, when you mentioned Beth Marcus, I would be remiss if I did not enter into this space around women in theological education that back in 1977, the Reformed Church Women's Ministries, the women got together and said, we want to support our sisters in who are called to seminary education. And they created a fund called the Beth Marcus, Beth E. Marcus Scholarship Fund. And it is the, the only remaining named fund that exists within the RCA itself. And we are the stewards of that fund and it continues to grow and prosper and continues to bless women in the MFCA at Western and at New Brunswick. And we've been able to shape it in these last few years so that it can help even more women and um, some of those women that are coming up through the non-traditional uh, pathway. So just to say that when, when you're talking, Mary, about women needing women, every year we give God thanks for that Beth Marcus Scholarship Fund and for those women that created it. And we're, we're delighted that it's named in her honor because then we can also be remembering her. Um, so, so yeah, so I just wanted to name that, that, that that's something that that's, it's, a, it's part of the legacy of RCA women. Well, in, in the year 2000, um, that sort of, uh, came Arlene uh, Waldorf, uh, finished her term as head of RCWM and the RCWM and the Commission uh, for Women came together and they wanted an office, an office for women with a full-time paid head. And the denomination said to the women, um, sure, uh, that's, but you have to raise $800,000 first to fund the office. Well, can you imagine what a kick in the head that was for women? All these years of raising money for women. And then to be told, you have to raise $800,000 among yourselves for your own office. Oh, that was a hard time, but we tried. 
but we didn't come up with 800,000. I think we came up with 600 about, but worked very hard. But the bottom line is once that was that drive, in-step drive was completed in uh, uh, December of 2004, um, Mary Clark started as a part-time coordinator and we have never, re there, there was a kind of interlude until Transformed and Transforming uh, established this women's initiative. But all of this follows a trend, you see, that um, is, is, is needing to find new and different ways of meeting the needs of women. And certainly you've each described marvelous ways to hear uh, at New Brunswick and Western both coming up with new ways of encouraging women. Mary, another piece of that is, you know, we're, we're here to speak about theological education today, right? That was kind of our, our the request from James. But to say too, there's, and I think when you were, we, we sort of went back and forth via email with this, that there's, it's, it's beyond just the theological institution, uh, the higher education institution, or and also our colleges as well, because there's people taking, you know, having degrees in Bible study or what have you. But also to say our classes and our regions, there, there's other assemblies where um, we're supporting women getting equipped for ministry, having access to theological education, that, that that's also part of, uh, that's also part of the, the bigger puzzle, if you will. There's pieces there as well um, that need attention. And we wanna keep leaning into encouraging our classes to make sure that they do have mentoring for women, that they have encouragement for women that are coming especially into newer places. I know many of you, um, that are in the ordained uh, offices overcame things early on in your contexts and some still today. Uh, but to say that we do have places where, you know, the Holy Spirit's on the move, opening up classes to um, wanting to invite women more fully in, but they really don't know how. There's some, you know, uh, assumptions that are made that like, oh, we just, we just welcome them in and everything will be great. But there's, there's, uh, so some structure that needs to be placed around that and some thought and intention around making sure that those women, that it's hospitable, it's equitable and that it's hospitable. And so I think that's another place that we could be um, looking for partnership and looking for connections is how to help women in those contexts to be able to, um, to live fully into what God is calling them to. Well, it's interesting that you know, Norm uh, was on the faculty at Western for 13 years and then he became president of New Brunswick for 13 years. So we've lived in the context of both of these traditions. And it's very, very interesting to observe them. But I don't know as though the denomination has done as good a job as it might in identifying this. You know, we have a problem. We have a tension. And we need to address that tension. Do we want to be, uh, you, you know, you listen to the Black Lives Matter. Do we want to advocate for diversity, for inclusion in the church, or don't we? You know, it's a very, Lynn, Lynn spoke about this. You know, it's a, but the tension has gotten greater and greater as opposed to lesser and lesser. We used to have, you know, these big gatherings. We don't have gatherings anymore. Maybe the times don't permit it either, but we need to find ways to celebrate life together and to talk together and to, you know, especially for women, share our secrets, you see. Mary, I do just want to quickly say to you that that I, I'm so grateful for what you're saying. And I mean, the triennials, right? That everywhere I go, that's what people remember and that's what people yearn for. Uh, but in this season where we've been staying at home and where we've had the pandemic, um, God has blessed us with this. She is called Women in the Bible Study Series. We had 170 people engage with us over those nine weeks this summer. 
and we had up to 80 people on a webinar and then we'd break them into groups where they could share stories together and and um, unpack some of the the bible study and these were women's stories from the bible of course and we had the authors teach them and then there was a group of women about 30 women that wanted to keep meeting they were just what you're talking about they were so yearning for that connection and now we meet every other thursday night and it's part bible study part story sharing secrets absolutely all about the secrets and in a godly way and it's such a holy sacred way that we are so beautifully holding these stories and it's it's so life-giving so so thank you for reflecting that mary because we're we are seeking to be able to still do some you know meeting gathering connecting i think that is so so important and i i so appreciate the way that you just elevated that for us thanks well it's really fun to think about the number of ways that that um, there have been benefits from this this pandemic and being separated from each other. You know, there are some congregations that are flourishing. We'd hate to admit that, but they are. You know, there are people coming to church who otherwise wouldn't walk through that door no matter what. But, you know, it's it's fun to think about positives like that, yeah. Mary, I was thinking too about what you were saying about, you know, I, I said to somebody the other day, given how gifted and talented the RCA women are, it's weird that they haven't risen to places of power as I think they should have. And well, power is maybe not the best word, authority, leadership. Where's a woman seminary president? Where's the woman general secretary? Um, you know, why are there so few women elected as presidents of General Synod? Um, you know, those kinds of questions. So, um, so that's my concern right now. Um, what's keeping women from the places of leadership where they really ought to be serving these days? Um, and then I see that as a broader denominational issue and less of a seminary issue per se, but, um, but relevant. Well, you, you touched upon um, in your presentation, um, angry women, the image of angry women. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very careful of that. Mm -hmm. And we know that recent first ladies and um, have had to deal with, with that candidates for national office have had to deal with that. You can't afford to be angry. Mm -hmm. But what I found is a little anger goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And if I hadn't gotten angry about the absence of women's history and reform issues, I never would have written letters to Hazel, uh -huh. never. But I think I use that as, as just an example um, because maybe the women, uh, it, it, we have a long tradition, particularly in the, in the Midwest, of very defined roles for women. And an angry woman is is not doesn't fit into that category. Right. Yeah. Right. But boy, you better be thankful for for uh, angry women, single moms who raise kids. They're trying to you know school the pandemic, everything. Um, that's a side to it too. We are officially past our time, but we have three three people who've been faithfully kept their hands raised. It's easier to do that on Zoom than it is when we're all in, in um, Hageman Hall. So right now, without further ado, though, I'd like to call on Gloria Norton, who's been very patient. And then there will be two more who've already got their hands raised and we'll wrap up. Hi, James, it's John Norton that uh, is has the question. My wife is still okay. here. Uh, she hasn't been watching, I have. So my question is, uh, I'm very interested in those cultural forces on the outside that also come to bear upon why uh, seminaries, why individuals uh, choose whatever they're going to choose. Uh, I'm wondering if there has been any kind of work done with the political identity of a person and their uh, stance as to whether women should be allowed to uh, go into the ministry. 
I'm especially thinking of the fact that uh, one of the main center points in Western Michigan for Donald Trump to go back to over and over and over again, reaching for money based on his idea of a return to the past, the great America of the past. If there's any identity between uh, the churches in Grand Rapids who are great supporters of Western Seminary, I'm wondering if there isn't any kind of a correlation between those factors. I, I think there is, John. I think that's a great point. I, I put in the chat a uh, reference to Kristen Cobes Dumais' new book, Jesus and John Wayne. Um, and I strongly encourage looking at that because it's asking the same kinds of questions you are. She's tracing the rise of evangelicalism from the 1950s into onto Trump. And she's looking at how macho and masculinity and those kinds of things are such a big part of evangelicalism and the religious right politics and that sort of thing. And um, it's really a fascinating exploration of, of what you're asking that how much culture has influenced um, the church on this. And, you know, you look at, at the recent synods and the kind of the meanness that's gone on at synods and um, and you see that it's it it's exactly what's going on in politics. So I think there is a strong connection between if people see what's going on in politics and then that appears in the church too. And so instead of being countercultural, we're just representing exactly what the um, what the the country's doing. And and if it's okay for the president to play fast and loose with our norms and our polity and our rules, then why can't church people play fast and loose with our polity and our norms? So I see lots of parallels there. So thanks for asking about that. I just think that you have to name the demons. Right, right. Okay, um, Arlene Wilhelm. Thanks again, uh, James, for giving me the opportunity. I'm just going to go back a space to. Uh... Uh, you need to unmute, Arlene. Somehow you got muted again. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Thanks for having me back. Uh, uh, I was so glad when the triennials were raised again as something that's very much missed because I remember going to triennials years ago uh, where I sat as an ordained woman with women who were from very conservative congregations out West. And it was a breaking down of barriers. They could see a person who was not a crazy radical, you know, angry, <laughs> not, I mean, I was assertive, but I wasn't angry uh, woman. And, and I think that helped so much in, 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 in helping the, div the divisiveness. And, and, I, and I think that what John Chen said about, uh, about, uh, Women being being so influential in opinions in their families, uh, you know, they went home. They went home, and they talked about that triennial too. So, uh, and I think that was they were discontinued. I think it was primarily because of money, uh, and and not thinking about the consequences of, of of us not gathering and how important it is. And I'm so grateful for Zoom because it's allowed me to get together with many many different people all over the country and all over the world. And I thank you for, for doing your work with that, Liz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Arlene. Appreciate all that. And you know, the, 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 so the reason with what I understood when I really looked at the statistics around the triennial was at its heyday, it had been like upwards of 1500 women. And then towards the end, it was really, it, it definitely was trickling down. Um, and it was just sort of kind of the time that it was in. And, and many of the other uh, mainline Protestant churches that used to have those gatherings, there's just a few of them that still have them. now. I think the Evangelical Lutherans and the Presbyterian women still have them, but um, it, it kind of runs parallel to kind of a shift in women being available and, you know, having 
income to be able to, you know, to travel, to go to do those things. But there, it, it definitely, like it went down considerably in numbers. Um, Mary, I know Mary Cansfield could speak more clearly to that because she's who I sat with to learn some of this um, background on the triennials. But just to say that, you know, that's why, you know, we do the same COFA, like regionally, we could still kind of do these events where we could get together and enjoy each other's company and find encouragement and do just what you're saying. Have diverse women coming together to see how much more we have in common than we have um, that's not in common. And that is one of the things that I give God thanks for every time we meet in our Zoom group Bible study is, you know, we're from the North and the South and the East and the West. And that is really what it's about. And we have to guard ourselves. I say, we're not gonna let the worldly influence just as Lynn was, was saying, like we're seeing reflected in the church what's happening in society with this divisiveness, with this over and against mentality. We are, we serve a both and God. We are a both and people. And we've got to, we've got to hold tight to each other in that and not let ourselves be divided. The enemy seeks to divide and conquer, to isolate. And it's liberation theology, right? You keep us all separate and quibbling amongst ourselves and pitted against each other. Um, not then, you know, like the light can't shine through. So we have to keep guarding ourselves against that. It's it, to me, it's a spiritual practice really. Um, so anyway, I would love to see the day when we could do a triennial again. I don't know if that's going to happen, but um, any way that we can create ways for women to be connected and to find encouragement in each other and for men and women to be in, um, in right relationship uh, together. I'm all about that. I love community building. So any way we can make that happen. Thank you, Liz. Thank, Thank you. Arlene. Oops. Okay, Jill Fenske. Ah, oh, Jill. Hello, Lynn and Liz. It's good to see you this morning. I, um, I am, for those who don't know, I am a, a 1985 and 87 graduate from Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, and so I came in under the VTE, the Board of Theological Education, which is kind of an old dinosaur by now. Um, but the, but the, the issue I think that I wanted to raise and perhaps have you um, talk about just a little bit, because I know we're running late, um, is about how do we define leadership in the church? What does that look like? Um, I've had the experience of encountering uh, women who try to model male leadership styles, um, which is a little frustrating to me, um, but also this notion about success. What does it mean to be successful? Um, I had a um, white male from the denomination say to me about 10 years ago, you know, it's just such a waste for you to be at this little church in Nutley. And I said, well, a waste for who? Certainly not a waste for the people in Nutley. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, can you say something about that? How we, how even like we teach about what does leadership look like? What's the success look like? Mm -hmm. um, and how do, how do we begin to shift that? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm an NPR girl, so I'll take my answer offline. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think there's, there's always that tension between do we want to say, oh, women have a distinctive leadership style, you know, and, and there's problems with that because then they can get stereotyped into, oh, they're more motherly and maternal and they're nicer and they're not so confrontational and all that stuff. So I, I, I always wonder about that. So there's, you got to be cautious about that, but I think there are differences. Um, and yet I wonder sometimes if, you know, Again, more in the past, I'm not sure what the current practices are at the seminary, but I wonder if there was more of a sense of, you know, women will just be like, they'll be good old boys, but just in skirts and heels, you know? And so there hasn't been a lot of attention paid to kind of women's distinctive leadership style. And again, I think Liz is trying to do a lot of change with that, but, um, but that's a very interesting question. And then when you do get women who, um, you know, who speak up. I, I referenced in the in the chat a little bit ago about, you know, still being uh, punished for my my words at General Synod in 2019. You know, I was just very direct and, and I didn't pull any punches. And I think that's kind of a masculine style and, and men do that all the time and get away with it. And I was asked to apologize on the floor of Synod, <laughs> you know, so, um, so I, I, I think that's a really good question that needs a lot more thinking about. What is, what is women's leadership style? I think there's multiple styles. So how do you help women sort out how they're gonna be the, the best leaders they can be? Um, 
without being what I would call leadership Barbie, um, people who kind of trot out all these like, like these leadership lightless language and words and stuff and like they're filling a fitting a pattern somewhere. So, so what's the most authentic way we can be leaders? That's a great question and I don't have the answer to it. Brilliant, Lynn. Jill Fenske, thank you for, for being with us and for, for asking such a great question. And, you know, just to uh, celebrating, Reverend Jill Fenske is our second longest um, woman minister in her own pulpit, in, in the same pulpit. So she has been serving alongside the good people of her congregation for now, is it 28 years, Jill, I think? Um, so, it'll be 30 in March. 30. Oh, <laughs> the years go faster than I can count them. Jill's been on our guiding coalition for several years now. So when she came in, it was 27 years. So yes, that was almost four years ago. So yes, time time marches on. Um, but Jill, when you're talking about uh, the measure of success, I appreciate that. And I think that's important because as we're looking for uh, like equity and respect for women in the RCA, we find that, you know, when you do when you do the audit of, of, of the, the size of the congregations and who's in the pulpit, the women skew much more to be in the smaller uh, congregations. And so that's seen as less than, right? We also had this season where we, we saw women in chaplaincy as being sort of like the minister minus, right? Being a specialized minister was less than having your own pulpit. And so again, that I think we have to pay attention to those things and we have to speak out against them. And I think I think we've done a good, a, a reasonable job with the chaplaincy business because I mean, honestly, chaplains are on the front line of ministry. They are missionaries. Um, and 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 uh, yeah, so, so I, think, I think to be able to help those places where women are serving not to be seen as less than successful is really important. Thanks for bringing that up. And thank, thank you everyone, um, all the partis all of you who've been here participating, listening, especially thank you to Lynn and to Liz. Thank you to Amanda Brule and Steve Mann who have been quietly behind the scenes making sure that things keep running on our Zoom feed and we don't suddenly fade away into cyberspace. Um, I would remind everybody before you leave, um, you know, Lynn, you know, Jill asked good questions and Lynn said, we need to explore those questions more. There is through the Reformed Church Center, a fund for research into RCA women called the Hazel B. Gennady Fund. Um, Lynn had that fellowship last year. Um, this, this year, um, Anna Jackson has that fellowship and is doing oral history, some oral histories. Um, and very soon we will be sending out the call for proposals for the 2021-22 um, fellowship. And so be thinking about, you know, if you've got a question that you'd like to have some time to do a little bit of research and share your ideas about, that would be the that would be a great place for you to be able to do that. Um, you can, even though the call hasn't gone out for this year's proposals, you can go to the Reformed Church Center page at nbts.edu and under research and scholarship, you'll find information about just what that entails and you can be thinking about that. And I would hope we'd have many women applying. Thank you everyone. It has been wonderful to be here with you this afternoon. I hope to see you all again very soon. Goodbye. Thank you, James. Bye.